Yeah, hello and welcome to the A-League Agenda presented by Neds. I'm Daniel Garb. This is Robbie Cornthwaite. Great to have your company again for another week. I think it's fair to say after the first leg of the semi-finals, Robbie, things are delicately poised. They certainly are. You want a, a nice open tie and you can say that nobody is out of the equation in terms of making the A-League Grand Final. So we're set for a massive second leg of semi-finals this weekend. Let's take a look firstly at Melbourne City and Sydney FC because uh, Sydney FC have got this momentum wave at the moment. Adam LaFondra, 6-6, six in six, and some of his comments as well during the week saying people had written him off, people had written Sydney FC off. It feels like it's a backs-to-the-wall mentality that they've got there after they fought back from Matt Leckie's early goal. Yeah, it certainly was. I mean, it was a great performance from Sydney FC. Obviously, Sydney missing the first penalty, LaFondra stepping up and slotting that, that's uh, obviously a lot of pressure on a spot kick like that. Um, I mean, this could be the last time we see him in a Sydney FC shirt if things don't go the right way. He's 36, as he said, people have been writing him off all year, but in the back end of the season, six and six, he's more than proved himself. And I think maybe those injuries during the year might have just freshened him up because I don't think he's looked as sharp as he has uh, this season. Comments as well about the formation and the system that they've been playing is actually providing him with more opportunities to score. And I think this season, Sydney's expected goals is actually very, very high. They just haven't found the back of the net and kept it out at the other end regularly enough. Big talking point during the week from a Melbourne City point of view, Jordan Voss and uh, his deal being secured to move to Belgium for what is a record transfer uh, for an Australian club. What do you make of that in the lead up to the second leg of the semi-final and Jordan Boss? How high should the expectations be on this 20-year-old young gem? Oh, it should be very high. I think he's had an exceptional season. Um, he showed maturity beyond his years. We know he started as an attacking player um, and now found his home at left back. The sum paid is obviously a record transfer fee. And I just wonder whether... Do you think this is a better move going directly to a club in Belgium or is it better to go to, a, say, a Man City and get loaned there? Well, I think when you have a club like Westerlo outlaying in excess of $2 million, that suggests they're going to play him and give him a lot of chances yep. when they've made that investment. I'm on the record of saying I think he's the best youngster Australia has at the moment and there are plenty to choose from. Where do you rank him amongst the other young talents? Well, I think if someone's willing to pay $2 million, he certainly is the best talent. Obviously, as I said, he's a little bit older, so he's got a bit more maturity, played a full season uh, this year and has been outstanding in a team that, that finished first. So uh, it remains to be seen. Obviously, we can only judge it at the end of their careers, but I think he's got a huge future. Looks like he suits any league. That's the most exciting aspect of Jordan Boss's game at the moment. Jamie McLaren has lit things up uh, for Melbourne City all season long. He was quiet in the first leg, though. He certainly was. He had basically one opportunity to score, and that was from an offside position, which uh, Andrew Redmayne saved anyway. Uh, most of City's chances came from set pieces. The goal, another one that hit the crossbar, but I don't think uh, Melbourne City would be too worried about Jamie McLaren being quiet. He's got a record of scoring goals and uh, I expect him to probably do something similar on the weekend. Yeah, didn't have a shot on goal. Didn't have a shot on goal in the grand final last season either. So we'll look uh, at how teams try to crowd a Jamie McLaren out in big games when it comes to the five-minute prime and we really do our big preview of this game. But that is something worth thinking about when it comes to Melbourne City as they try to take hold of the semi-final series. Central Coast have got the advantage after the trip to Adelaide. You want to talk about Adelaide's defence and their inability to, uh, to hold the Mariners out because they look a little bit shoddy in one-on-one -on -one situations, don't they? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, much can be said about the setup and the, the tactics and the formation defensively, but I thought, you know, leading into this game, Adelaide spoke about one-on-one -on -one football. Central Coast make you play accountable football and Adelaide were absolutely embarrassing in the one-on-one -on -one situations. You see Isaias here, a player of immense experience, diving in in the middle of the park, basically allowing the Central Coast to waltz on through. You see here again, Javi Lopez this time. That is not the time to go and press. Drop back into position, slow them down. Ben Warland, another one. This is this is schoolboy uh, stuff. This is a an A-League semi-final, and Adelaide's got a problem where they think rushing in and trying to win the ball is defending. It's not. This is a prime example. Tilio's going absolutely nowhere, and Ben Halloran mm. just dives in and gives away a free kick in a dangerous position. That is lazy, Garby. You could you could do that. <laughs> get low, move your feet, force them wide, and don't let them get a shot away, and don't let them beat you so easily. Central Coast, though, have the luxury of 
being so fluid in attack. Apart from Jason Cummings at the point, the rest of them can all rotate different positions around him with Ballard and, and Nisbet sitting back almost as midfield sweepers. That makes it hard for Adelaide to set up defensively as well and, and probably exacerbates the problem they've got that you speak about. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, Adelaide were poor, but Central Coast were brilliant. They made Adelaide play this way. I thought Nick Montgomery's got his tactics absolutely spot on and their ability to get on the back of the Adelaide United midfield pressure, receive the ball, turn and face forward. And we spoke about that one-on-one -on -one football. They've got players running forward. You saw Jason Cummings getting behind and score. It happened numerous times with Silvera on the left and Kololo uh, as well. Um, Central Coast had Adelaide's number in that first 45 minutes. Aaron Kunda and Craig Goodwin are the two most dangerous players for Adelaide. We know about that. Where do you feel they sit after the first legs going into the return leg in, on the Central Coast? Yeah, I thought they were both absolutely brilliant. Adelaide's best chances, obviously, Craig Goodwin set up for Nesta when he came on off the bench. Uh, whether he starts or not, I think he should. It's obviously up to Carl Veer. We can touch on that a little bit later in the primer. Hiroshi Iribasuki obviously going out with a calf injury. So that number nine position now for Adelaide is a real problem. George Blackwood, Luka Jovanovic, who scored a couple of goals this season. Um, but Nesta and Craig, they had that link up. Does he start? That's a big question. We'll uh, we'll dive into it a bit more a little bit later. Yeah, that's a big question for the uh, the finals primer when we look at Adelaide and Central Coast. Let's dive into Melbourne City and Sydney FC first, though. Let's start the clock on the five-minute finals primer and get Robbie Cornthwaite's analysis. We'll tell you who wins and why. Does it feel like Melbourne City have Sydney FC where they want them? They play the first leg. Sydney FC have got all the momentum. All right, we got through that. Now let's put them to the sword. Is that the feeling you've got about the premiers? Yeah, I mean, obviously City go there with absolutely sorry, Sydney go there with absolutely nothing to lose. The most under, you know, experienced underdog in A League history probably. But City haven't lost a game at home all season. Thirteen home games, ten wins, and three draws. This fixture, although they'll be a little bit cautious, it shouldn't hold any fear for City. But this is a free hit for Sydney FC. We've seen what they were able to do against the Wanderers when all the pressure was on Western Sydney. Um, there's every chance Sydney FC can do something. We know it is football, but I'd be very, very surprised if Melbourne City don't take this game away from them. As we said before, Jamie McLaren without a shot in the grand final last season, without a shot on goal in the first leg. So in big games, tense games, teams are crowding him out. How does he get around that? Can you see that being a factor in the second leg? I think Sydney did extremely well to get numbers behind the ball, numbers in the box, make it difficult for, for him to find space. Jamie McLaren's got unfinished business. When City won the title, he was sitting in quarantine. He hasn't played in a winning grand final. Lost against Wesley United last season, as you said, didn't have a shot on goal throughout that whole match. So I don't think they're going to be too worried. It's Jamie McLaren. I think if he's in and around that penalty area, sniffing around the six yard box, making his forward runs and, and providing space for Tilio, Naboo and Leckie, he's going to get his chance. I don't think there's uh, any doubt about that. And as I said, he's got a point to prove and he'll be hungry to do it. Does Steve Corica roll the dice and throw Joe Lolly in from the start despite his hamstring issues? I think he has to. I think the fact that he came on and replaced Mac on the weekend, didn't come on and play alongside him, says to me that those two will start. We know LaFondra scoring goals. We know um, they need to win. Although it's only a one, uh, it's a draw, so they only need to win by a single goal. I think that he has to start both of them. Uh, they're both his main attacking weapons. And, and the way Max Burgess moves in between the lines and drifts in and out of games, he's more than capable of slipping one of those players in. Will we have a big upset? Or will Melbourne City get the job done and make it through to the grand final? I love rooting for the underdog, but I don't think so. I think Melbourne City have been far too good. Teams that have had the most joy against City this season have had a go. So I think Sydney FC have got nothing to lose and should have a real crack. This is what we love about the two-leg semi-finals. It's all set up for an epic night in Melbourne on Friday night. It will be something special on the Central Coast on Saturday evening. Don't worry about that. Plenty of tickets sold for uh, Central Coast Mariners and Adelaide United second leg. Central Coast leading 2-1. There's going to be a lot of hype and a lot of excitement, a lot of energy running through that team. Do they just try and embrace that and go with it? Or they have to be a little bit cautious with this uh, goal advantage they have? No, I think they just embrace it. I think the fact that they haven't been in a grand final for a decade, this is probably the best chance they're going to get in some time. Full stadium is only going to help them. Um, and I think the reason is Central Coast game is built on work ethic. Um, that hasn't been questioned at all this season. They always turn up in that sense. And then they've got the quality and the tactical nous to get the better of Adelaide. They've done it three times. The only way they don't go through is if the pressure gets to them. We don't know how they're going to perform. They do have some young players, but some experienced heads as well. I feel like they're the team that's peaked 
at the perfect moment and I expect them to get the job done. It feels like if Adelaide are going to overturn this one goal deficit, Carl Viet needs to do something different. He has got an ace up his sleeve and that ace is Nestoria and Kunda from the start. Does he play it and does he play the young gun from the off in order to just try and change something in this tie? Does he do it? I think he doesn't. Should he do it? I think he should. So um, obviously he's the manager. He's stuck to his guns all season. He knows bringing on Nesta late against tired legs has, has worked so well for them so but far. But it could be gone by then. It, it could, could be over. Be, well, this is the thing. If you start Nesta, you could be two up inside 20 minutes. You just don't know. I think um, the other changes, I'd like to see Aligic come in for Isaias and play Dorigo as a more defensive uh, midfield role and I think Nesta in for Ben Halloran that number nine position as I said Luka Jovanovic let's get some kids mobility work ethic um, you know they're fearless um, I want him to start let's see him start if he does start though the Mariners have used Jacob Farrell as a tag almost on Iren Kunda in the last couple of meetings so what does that do to the Mariners what a tactical and psychological battle this is going to be between the two so we're talking about a 17 year old and a 20 year old brilliant how are they going to shape a semi-final McGarry was almost man of the match in the first leg scored a wonderful goal it's going to be huge and, and then you got Mark Milligan yesterday saying in the media or oh, well, maybe we'll switch him over to the other side the other thing about Nesta playing on the right is if he gets past Farrell then you got Brian Kaltak and he's sneaky quick he's clocked 37 kilometers an hour this season that's up there with the likes of Kylian Mbappe Marcus, Ra Marcus Rashford um, so I think maybe switching him to the left and letting him cut in and hit it on his right could be a, a good option for Adelaide. It's an awesome tactical subplot. Can't wait for the team sheets to see if Nestor Irin Kunda starts. More importantly, Robbie, who wins? Who goes through to the granny? The Mariners win and go through to the granny. It's a one-off game now, basically, and anything can happen. They've had their measure, um, but I think the Mariners have just showed way too much so far. We can't wait to see how it all pans out. This has been the A-League Agenda presented by Ned. It's been great to have your company.